thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, a very warm welcome to you all. For this, uh, a replacement along with a series of recorded lectures that we're going to be releasing over the next few weeks. For our long planned and very much look forward to, uh, if only by us, uh, annual lectures. We're really disappointed that we're not meeting in person, um, although as uh, fate would have it, of course, we would have been able to, just too late to rearrange uh, a whole in-person event again once the strikes uh, were announced as cancelled. Um, and uh, at some point this year, it'd be lovely to share a convivial drink with you. Uh, we very much hope to be able to do that later in the year with our Early Career Researchers Network. But we haven't been able to do this uh, for the last three years, as we said, um, during the COVID years. So we didn't want to yet again miss the opportunity to share with you the experiences, stories and outcomes of the fantastic work that's been continuing, uh, is it in spite of the very many challenges of that time. Ollie, could we move to the second slide, please? I just wanted to take the opportunity to take a step back to the autumn of 2020 uh, when we launched our new look, a new strategic framework and our five year funding priorities. Our starting point for our new strategic priorities was to look back at our charitable objectives, which are around research, understanding ageing, treating age-related disease, and improving health, social care, and housing provision for older people. But that's quite a big ask. Uh, so we set about articulating a more focused, but still fairly flexible set of themes. More importantly, I think, we agreed to set out some principles which we would try to incorporate in all that we do. And by doing that, to make our contribution to influencing the systemic change that's needed. And I'm going to come back to that later. Can I have the third slide, please, Ollie? One of the key themes we chose, which may seem a bit odd to some who think of us as a, just a medical research funder, was around creating age-friendly housing and communities. So why would a historically medical research funder choose to do that? Aside from the fact that our charitable objectives specifically mention housing, many, if not all of us here, will be familiar with Professor Michael Marmot's and others' work on the social determinants of health. One of those social determinants is housing. Poor quality housing harms health, and evidence shows that exposure to poor quality housing conditions is strongly associated with poor health, both physical and mental. The longer the exposure to poor conditions, the greater the impact. In summary, if you have suitable housing, you'll have better health outcomes. It's odd, I heard somebody say this week, I don't know how factual this is, that your home's EPC rating was a better determinant of your health than your medical record. And of course, there's the growing body of work on the detrimental impact on health of social isolation and loneliness and the importance of community. Um, slide four, please, Ollie. If anyone's familiar with the City University work on the case of the Whiteley Homes Trust back in 2017, you'll know that it found, certainly in the case of Whiteley Village, that community living of the type provided by Whiteley, which is an arms house trust, was capable of combating the negative effects on health and social well-being of lower economic means and isolation, indicating that the, certainly the women who lived there could expect to live as long as the wealthiest quintile of the population, despite coming from the most economically deprived quintile. We've since funded a larger study of arms house communities to see if these findings are indeed replicated. And you can hear more about that from Professor Ben Rikazin, David Smith and Alison Ben Zimra of the, of the United St. Saviour's Charity when they launched the results of this fascinating study. You'll be able to attend that lecture in person actually on the 20th of April at City University, or you can watch the recording when we circulate it as part of this lecture series. Can I have the fifth slide please, Ollie? In another recorded lecture of our series, you'll be able to hear from Dr. Mark Hammond of Manchester Metropolitan University and Professor Andrew Clark of Salford University, who with their community partners, and there are a number of them, uh, the, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, members of the Greater Manchester Housing Providers Network, One Manchester, the Southway Housing Trust, Stockport Homes and Inspiring Communities Together, amongst others, are two of the first recipients of our New Style Research Funding Awards. With community organisations as co-investigator partners, they're going to be discussing with Matthew Wynne, National Advisor on Community Health for NHS England, 
the importance of co-production and community involvement in creating age-friendly communities and living environments, the all-important designing of services looking from the other end of the telescope by actually asking the people who experience them. Slide six, please, Ollie. Staying with the theme of creating strong, strong communities and addressing social isolation, we were also due to hear from Sarah Orport, our Head of Communities and Governance, about our million pound intergenerational linking programme, which we funded jointly with the National Lottery Community Fund. Part of the hashtag I will campaign, which aims to form a habit for life and young people to volunteer and become involved in community action. This England wide programme focused on linking children of primary school age with local care homes. One of our delivery partners was the fantastic My Home Life, which was able to make more widely available through this programme, its Care Home Friends and Neighbours network, which aims to make it easier for care homes to safely open their doors and develop relationships with their local communities and help residents to feel that they belong. What we went to know when we formalised that partnership was that by the time you were ready to go live, the country would be locked down and that care homes would not be opening their doors. The teams rapidly pivoted their plans and, deliver, and the delivery methods that they were planning to great success, however, and we're going to be making the recording of that end of programme celebration event, which they held online at the end of last month, available with the other lecture releases so that you can hear more from them and from Sarah there. We're indebted to our delivery partners, My Home Life and the Linking Network for their energy, their enthusiasm and their resilience, most of all, I think, throughout this project which during its three years engaged over 400 young people with 200 elder people in care homes across England. In Bradford alone, the engagement has grown from 10 sites to 44 now. Slide seven, please. I mentioned earlier that as well as setting out some key themes for our focus, we also set out some principles we want to see running through all of our work. Three of these are involvement and engagement with users, equity, diversity and inclusion and multidisciplinarity. And I hope you'll be able to see these running through all the work that you're going to be hearing about. Um, slide eight, please. As someone who spent two years, uh, well, actually a long time working with engineers, I instinctively knew we needed to take a whole system approach if we were going to play our part in making change. But as a relatively small cog, it can sometimes be difficult to see the change you're making. So our fourth principle is around making connections and convening networks. We want to make our contribution to a future where if all of the services and providers who held a piece of the jigsaw puzzle can come together and collaborate, involving and engaging those who draw on the services, between us we can create the power to make change. And we have some news to share with you later on the topic of collaboration and creating networks, so please stay with us. A further contribution we felt we could make, which would have the potential for substantial long-term impact, was in equipping and supporting others to make change and creating and sustaining capacity in research and evidence building. That's why we're keen to support community organisations in developing resilience and supplying evidence of positive scalable change. Again, we have an important announcement about that later. Uh, and we want to continue to fund early career researchers through our doctoral and postdoctoral fellowships in partnership with other funders and with universities who have made a strategic commitment to age related research. And on that point, we also know that not everyone who embarks on an academic research career will be able to continue with one. And that's why we want to highlight and provide opportunities where we can support alternative research career paths so that more of this talent can find its way into commercial product development, policy making, entrepreneurship and service development and delivery. Slide nine, please, Ollie. One example of this is that as part of our relatively new agreed impact investment policy, which sets out how we intend to make our endowment work harder for us, which we published in the autumn of 21, we've made our first investment in a mission-led pre-seed pre venture capital fund called Zinc. Zinc exists to build and scale new ways to solve some of our most important societal problems by empowering talented and motivated people to redirect their careers and focus on creating solutions to these problems. And one of the key constituencies that they're looking to attract are the academic and clinical community. Um, one of its key missions being improving the quality of later life. 
And so we're really delighted um, that Zinc's chief scientist, Dr. Rachel Carey, has agreed to join us to discuss why we're taking this uni uh, unique approach and about some of their challenges and successes. Again, we'll be circulating the link to her recording in April. So that's a rather breathless run through the thinking behind our strategic framework for this plan period. A few examples of some of the work that our superb award holders and partners have been up to um, and what you can expect to hear in our forthcoming lecture series. We really do urge you to log on to hear more from our speakers uh, about those things as we release their lectures over the coming weeks. But now I want to turn to the first of those sessions and to give you a bit of background. Um, if you wouldn't mind turning your cameras on now, please, um, David uh, uh, Pearson and Roy Sambach and uh, our chair, Alison Petch, who are going to be joining me for this session. Um, slide 10, please, Ollie. Um, so in the run up to launching our strategic framework, and partly as a way to provide some context for it, we funded two major programmes of work, which departed somewhat from our customary way of working. The Commission on the Role of Housing in the Future of Care and Support, and the Technology for an Aging Population Panel for Innovation, or TAPI. In both of these pieces of work, we wanted to take a top down and a bottom up approach to influencing the system, that is, to convene multidisciplinary, multi-professional groups informed by service users to pull together research and evidence to bring to the attention of policymakers, but importantly, to also provide some resources at the locality level to enable communities to just get on with making change, piloting and testing in innovations and ideas, which could not only directly benefit the localities, but to also serve to highlight successful and scalable ideas to policymakers and influence other funders to get involved. We also appointed delivery partners to provide us with the deep sectoral knowledge and communications and policy influencing expertise that we needed. For the commission work, this was the Social Care Institute for Excellence, and for TAPI, the Housing Learning and Improvement Network, who were building on the approach that they developed in developing the HAPI principles, which were about housing for an aging population. For phase two of the TAPI programme, we brought on board the fabulous Tech Services Association, the industry advisory body for tech enabled care in the UK. And here I want to pay tribute to Sky's Rebecca Luff, Catherine Smith, Paul Burstow and a range of others who've worked so hard to bring to, uh, to bring the work of the Commission and TAPI to the attention um, of the revolving doors and ministers in the relevant departments. We saw that the hard work, uh, we saw all of that hard work actually reflected in the social care white paper people at the heart of care and I'm sure we will in the task force on elder people's housing which we're told is due to be announced quite shortly now. I'd also like to thank Jeremy Porteous and his team at Housing Lynn for their work and contribution to both TAPI and, and the Commission and particularly to Lois Beach in the delivery of the TAPI 1 report. That report from phase one of the, of the TAPI programme was published in October 21 and proposed a, a set of 10 TAPI principles to underpin a framework for commissioning, procurement, and product and service development. And these are now being tested in six locality demonstrated sites in phase two of the programme. While on the face of it, these two programmes might seem to focus on quite different things, one on bricks and mortar, one on technology. In fact, they're really interconnected. Both start from the premise of redesigning and rethinking how we prepare a population that is ageing and giving the population choice independence and ultimately healthier outcomes. You can see the full reports and the information and resources from both programmes of work on the Housing Lynn and Sky websites and we've posted link to, links to these on the new events section of our website which has uh, which is now live. I'm now going to pause, that's quite enough of me because I want to introduce uh, my three guests here today. Um, we have with us um, our chair, um, Professor Alison Petch, um, uh, chair of the DMT board. Um, as she says, she's now retired from paid work, but always seems to be hugely uh, busy with uh, her interest and support of a number of organisations working to improve the quality of life for older people. Um, her research in, in, uh, interests during her career have centred around the balance of care and support across community and institutional settings and in partnership working across housing, health and care. Uh, we also have with us Professor Roy Sandbach, uh, uh, formerly Director of the National Innovation Centre for Aging at Newcastle University, 
uh, where he remains a visiting professor, as indeed he is at Cranfield and Central St Martins. He's vice chair of Sunderland's Ageing Well Board. Roy spent 31 years at Procter & Gamble, um, uh, leading innovation programmes across the world, and is now, we're very fortunate to, uh, to have him chairing uh, our TAPI programme. Uh, I also would like to, do we, do we have Dave, is David with us? Um, I can't see him on my screen. I know he was speaking. At yes, the, I am with you. I am Excellent. A, I am with You're you. There. <laughs> Although um, I'm, I'm on my screen, it says Serena Perek. But it she, does. <laughs> she, she's lent, um, she's lent me her computer because I'm at the Royal College of Physicians. Physicians. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. I'm so pleased. I know I'm, I'm delighted you've, you've been able to join us. And thank you so much because I know you've uh, suffered a few vicissitudes of, trans of public transport this morning. So uh, thank you. It's great to see you. David's chair of Tech Quality, the sister organisation to the TSA. Um, he's passionate about choice and control for older people uh, who need social, who need to draw on social care and, and health, um, and, and about quality and effectiveness of services. He co-chaired with um, Paul Burstow and Professor Julia Mayer, our Commission on the Future of Housing with Care and Support. Um, and as I say, that uh, report was published in November 21. He's a former director of adult social care and um, uh, uh, and health and deputy chief and was deputy chief executive for Nottinghamshire County Council. Um, he took up the role of senior lead on all social care related matters in the NHS for the COVID-19 response at the end of March 2020 and was subsequently asked to lead the government task force on COVID-19 in the social care sector. So without further ado, David, um, could you now join us to tell us a little more about the commission, um, why you agreed to chair it? It was, after all, dealing with some very knotty problems um, that many have tried to address and not really quite got there. Um, so, yeah, over to you to talk a bit more about, about the commission. Thank you very much. And I, I'm delighted to be here. And first of all, I'd like to thank Dunhill for um, commissioning this piece of work through Sky and, and what, it, what a pleasure it was to chair it. I think at the time that I was asked to chair it, I was in the midst of chairing the government task force on the pandemic. So I did, my initial reaction was, I can't do this, I'm too busy. And then after about two and a half minutes, careful reflection thought, I can't not do this, this is too important. And the reason why I thought it was important is that um, as a long-term uh, director of adult social care and before that spending you know, many decades in the health and social care sector, I just knew, I just know how important it is to develop housing solutions and options for people who um, either by virtue of disability or increasing age need a greater deal, deal, deal of flexibility. And in, in Nottinghamshire, I was led a number of programmes on developing housing options for both older people and uh, younger adults, I under 65. And, um, we had some success, um, but it was a labyrinthine, enormously challenging process. And in Nottinghamshire, as indeed up and down the country, I knew we just hadn't made enough progress it, to meet the burden and need of the people of this country. And in fact, I think that was evidenced by the uh, Commission because um, we, we, we did some cross international um, comparison and found that actually we are um, fairly below the curve in terms of progress on this compared with other countries in the developed world. So that that really was the, the sort of the, the, the precursor to it. And then just my final anecdote is that I became the chair of the Nottingham Nottingham Integrated Care System in 2016, something I did for five years. And I, and I remember a, um, a, a clinical commissioning group chief executive saying, we need to spend more time worrying about the 1.1 million beds that are in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire rather than the two and a half thousand beds that are in the acute sector. Because if we did, people would have better outcomes and, uh, and, and, we, and the system would be more effective. So I thought that was quite a powerful comment and I thought I'd share it with you. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So the aims were to co-produce the sector and, and people with lived experience and the co-produce with the people with lived experience is absolutely crucial. 
and in my view profoundly changes our perception of things but we had a wide cohort of people from the sector involved in the commission group um a, a huge amount of support for people i think which probably recognizes or is a result of um the things that i've talked about that people could see just how important this is although not sufficiently addressed in both policy and implementation terms up and down the country although people lots of people we're applying shoulders to the wheel and best endeavours, but making not fast enough progress. We wanted to recommend policy changes to inform the government's thinking on the long-term plan for social care. And I think partly, I would like to think because the quality of the work was pretty decent, but also we had good timing. I think a, a number of our recommendations and approaches found its way into the social care white paper. And we wanted to develop not only just have a vision, because I think it's visions are important, but we wanted to develop a roadmap to have some idea about some practical solutions and um, steps that we should be taking both the country and locally in order to make these, these things happen. And part way along, just on the practical side, one part way along in the commission, we, we actually added a piece of work which um, Susan kindly championed in terms of funding it about the some of the financial implications about how to make this stack up so we produced some pretty detailed work which is in my experience fairly unique um, around um, how the funding fits together or might fit together next slide please so this is the um, the, the the circle on the left shows the uh, if you like the governance the the co-production collective being a key part of this the stakeholder ref reference group um, our co-chair so uh, there was myself paul burstow and julian mayer and it's been was so great to work with them as well as the overall commission panel and then a series of, of strands of work on the right hand side which actually were a mixture of specific analytical tools like the population survey and the cost benefit tool um to things that were much more about and literature and evidence were much more about tone and style such as appreciative inquiry next slide please so we called it a place we can call home and this is based on the social care futures um uh, view of what social care and wider public services should be doing in this space um, and that's uh, we all want to live in a place we can we call home with the people and things we love in communities where we look out for one another doing the things that matter most and sometimes we um, professionalize these things or we institutionalize them in such a way that actually um nobody really understands what we're talking about and this is so wonderfully crisp and simple and evocative about what actually most of us want it's just that it's not any different it's not it's just that some people need more help to get those things that's that's the point and that's what this is what we uh, uh produced next slide please so one of the things we discovered was that in terms of the public survey um not surprisingly uh although 65 percent of those age 55 plus are given at least some thought to their own future housing and care needs um, and that 20% said COVID had changed how they feel about the type of housing they might need. It led to everybody feeling a bit more thoughtful about the future and so on. Um, I think many people were demonstrated also low levels of understanding about housing options. They're probably, as I, as, as I suggested, are insufficient levels of housing options. But even amongst those that there are, people had a low level of understanding of them, which just demonstrates how important effective communication and discussion about these things is. Um, and, and, and so the other thing that this demonstrates is that people want to maintain their independence, want to live in their own home. And if we compare the stats around Retirement village, for example, um, compared with care home, 94% have heard of it, but only 37% thought they would consider living in it. And retirement village, obviously, it's closer. It's 82% to 69%. And extra care, even more, even more closely. So um, 
I think I think what that uh, demonstrates is the sort of options that people want to see. And I certainly remember as a director of adult social care being asked by the senior cabinet member at the time when we were looking at extra care facilities and creating 200. He said, but how many do we need, David? And I said, probably about 2,000, not 200, um, because most of the people who are in residential care would prefer to be in a more independent environment. And that's not to say that residential and nursing care don't have their place in the panoply of, of provision, but it, but it shows that actually we're failing to meet people's aspirations. And indeed, we probably could meet their aspirations if we had the facilities. But if you consider that an extra care facility typically in this country takes over five years from inception to creation, and that's because we have so many different funding streams, we have um, so many different governance arrangements and organisations, it's a very complex landscape we discovered. Next slide, please. So um, what, what our, our 10 year roadmap was trying to frame some immediate priorities, um, medium term priorities and longer term priorities, recognizing that it's important to start build momentum um, and that helps with the longer term vision. If we just have a longer term vision and we don't show the intermediate steps, then typically such documents get left on the shelf and don't receive action. So we had, um, uh, in the immediate priorities, you could see a, a national policy framework building momentum for change uh, based around vision, based around investment, rights and workforce strategy. And in terms of local action, place-based housing for older people plans. And my own personal view, having been involved in the movement around integrated health and social care in this country for a number of years, is that the, currently the integrated care partnerships, were, which are part of the legislative environment of integrated care systems, which are the partnership vehicle, have a responsibility to provide health and care strategies. And, um, and, and indeed, um, uh, I think that they are a, a, an opportunity for health and care systems to place housing at the centre of this and develop such approaches nationally, pulling together the various constituent organisations. And then in the medium term, we um, listed a number of things that we thought needed to happen that were to a degree about structural issues, about changes to national planning arrangements, um, showcasing campaigns, that information advice and guidance which help people to, to, to understand there are more options. Um, and also bringing together the final point in that national action, some of the funding streams in, um, in by way of expanding the use of individual service funds, bringing together various strands of funding. And then we cited a whole load of um, local actions that people can, uh, can undertake. And again, in my role as the chair of the integrated care system in Nottingham, Nottinghamshire, we had some um, initiatives on housing and care, health and care, and found that actually by investing relatively small amounts of money in developing more housing options that were more suitable for people, um, the return on investment for the health service in particular was quite significant. And then finally, on the longer term priorities, you can see about having annual progress reports, scaling innovation and the workforce plans. And on the workforce, I just want to mention that what we discovered, what well, well, thought was that actually um, the way in which the workforce are uh, um, sensitised and understanding of um, the housing options and also those people helping develop them was pretty critical. If we don't skill people up and give them the capacity, then this wouldn't work. Next slide, please. So we wanted a to, to emphasise a place-based approach to housing with care and support, which actually fits with the new integrated care uh, legislation and guidance, because each part of integrated care systems should have place-based partnerships, which are at a slightly smaller level and can be afforded by 42 integrated care systems in England. Um, and, um, and we thought that there should be some obligation on single place-based plans. Uh, bringing together the various partnerships in the way that I've described. Next slide, please. So um, we also, as we said, fed into the um, 
the overall um, national planning around the white paper on people at the heart of care. And um, Sue, Susan mentioned the uh, impending task force, and I think I'm hopeful that uh, that will hopefully go further by bringing together departments of states, um, such as the one on communities levelling up uh, with social care to give this further thought. And I think it's only in about 2015 that the, the first ever housing strategy was, was, was developed in terms of a white paper that mentioned the changing needs of the population around older people and people with disabilities. Um, previously, white papers and housing policy have been entirely focused on the important um, needs of uh, families to create increased provision for families. But, but obviously, um, what we also have is something that actually is important for the overall housing stock, as well as for health and social care. So we're hopeful of that. But there was a commitment in the white paper to... Um, uh, uh, 250 million pounds worth and towards 500 million of investment in this particular sector um, and we are still to see the fruits of that but obviously we're hoping that will go further forward as we um, develop this task force as people participate in it. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for that and uh, I'll hand back to Sue for the next yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thanks so much, David. That gave us a, a really good uh, sort of go through because it's so it's, it's quite a, a little while ago now. Um, uh, but but, you know, these issues are still very much live. And, and I should say, we're hoping to hear about the announcement of the task force. Um, so um, I just want to bring Roy in here um, so that we can sort of have a similar uh, we can get everybody on the same page uh, with regard to what we set out to do with TAPI. Roy, can you tell us a little more about TAPI and why you wanted to get involved? Sure, Sue. Um, can you, uh, assuming you can all hear me, just the ones that are on camera. Yeah, great. It's um, it's a joy to, to join you. And uh, it's great to hear from David, who frankly has taught me a great deal over the past few years with respect to the way in which housing, uh, and in, in my case, in the case of TAPI, technology uh, and care and health, all sit in a space where they overlap a bit, not necessarily strategically, and um, where there's huge opportunity and huge need. Um, so, so, so you asked the question, why? Well, um, uh, you know, in principle, um, I didn't really want to go and lie on a beach when I retired. That was the reason why. Um, but more seriously, um, I, I believe that a civilized society is measured on how it treats its youngest and its oldest. And our aging population needs our help to live happier, better lives. Um, and I found with Dunhill a sense of common cause. That's, I think, point number one. And I think also, you know, you get nowhere if you just try an idea. In the end, you've really got to implement. And I think one of our issues in this space, and uh, I speak, by the way, as, a, as someone who's arguably on the boundaries of the detail. I'm not in the weeds of working in care. Um, I see lots of wonderfully valiant attempts to get um, uh, common cause innovation uh, tested, uh, but I see huge gaps that exist in the context of significant step change implementation. Uh, so that's my cards on the table. Uh, I, let me just mention, a, there were three people that, um, that made me really want to lean forward on this. Um, so I'll call someone S. She's 94 and she's lived in her own house for most of her life. Uh, she's not there now, but um, for about three or four years, technology helped her to, uh, to live in her own house and for her family to know that she was safe and secure. However, I think she was lucky I think provision of that kind is uncertain, uh, 
families are unaware and it's patchy. Uh, then um, the, there's someone else uh, who I'll call R, who is sort of nearly 70 and lives in the country. And his children are worried about his life alone over the next 10 to 15 years and their awareness of technology in the context of keeping him independent and living independently well is very limited. And then I'll just mention briefly someone whose initial is G and she lives alone. She's in her forties and she has no children. And when she gets into her sixties, she's gonna be one of, a, of an increasing demographic of women uh, without children um, who will need support as they enter their old age. And it's a, um, I think, you know, we've got a, mul a multiple of uh, issues to address there. And I think technology can help. Now, it, you know, in, in reality, I think there are probably two massive issues. One of them is that technology provision isn't a default in the context of people living in their own houses independently. And it could, and it possibly should be. But in addition, and I think professional commissioning, and I mean, David, and other, we've I've talked long and hard to many people who, many wonderful people, by the way, who work in the public sector in this context. But in the end, commissioning of technology to support people isn't default. But in addition to that, there's another issue, which is that, that there isn't a consumer market for technology to help people live happily longer in their own houses. So we've got two issues. One is the professional commissioning and the other one is the consumer market. And honestly, TAPI can surely help in that context. So I'm going to talk about TAPI, to bring you up to speed with TAPI briefly, and then we can get into discussion. It's a pity. It's a, such a shame we're not all together. Anyway, uh, so I've chaired TAPI now for a couple of years with wonderful support huge support from Sue and her colleagues at Dunhill, from Jeremy and Lois and the Housing Lynn, uh, and and obviously from TSA. Um, and it's been a just a fantastic experience for me. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Um, next chart, please. It was derived really from um, HAPI, which was the Housing for Our Aging Population report which led to some significant frameworks for engagement in good thinking and good practice for housing. Uh, and we thought TAPI could follow that. Next chart, please. Um, I had a wonderful panel. Uh, I can't describe how expert they were. Uh, I'll just say one thing, however, that it was brilliant to bring together people from different parts of this multi-agency issue uh you know talking through perspectives from different through different lenses is so important and i should also say that it was it's been extremely valuable to have um uh some perspectives from best practice across the globe and to have ikea directly involved in the panel uh, they bring uh, both corporate uh, multinational and retail view and design view, frankly, to the panel. Uh, we had great expert witnesses um, who gave us perspectives and insights. And the TAPI report fits, it's intended to fit and not repeat with the uh, the other commissions, which have, which in, in fact, David's, you know, just talked to us, talked to us about the sky about the sky report uh, it fits um, it dovetails next chart oh, look uh, i've known this for the whole of my career but people are at the heart of developing things for people um, so let's just put that to one side so in in this context co-production is the is is what people talk about now but frankly just having the user at the center of conversations and in the room is so critical. We observed what you all know, I suspect, that processes and systems to allow technology to be considered uh, siloed and collaboration is sometimes difficult. Uh, people don't have time and they don't have awareness. We also, by the way, but really found that 
knowledge and training in this context is patchy at best. And I, I should, I'll give you one example. We had a wonderful conversation with um, occupational therapists uh, who would like to bring technology into their hugely expert area of operation, but that they they felt that they didn't have the kind of up-to-date knowledge that would allow them to advocate best practice. We developed 10 TAPI principles, which I'll come to in a minute, um, which here's my wish that they're on every desk when, when housing and technology for older people and the vulnerable um, are considered uh, because technology is not that default. So let's get these principles on the desk. And I'll say this, if we wait for top-down policy to provide for this, we'll be waiting a long time. If we can have a bottom-up movement to establish how we use some of these principles that I'll talk about in a minute for the benefit of people, then we get somewhere. We all can do that. In fact, I'm recruiting you all to do it. Next chart, please. These are the 10 principles from TAPI 1. Um, I won't go through them now, but they're, you might think they're obvious, but the fact of the matter is they're not always talked about. Next chart. We're moving to delivery by testing these principles in six test bed areas. Um, I'm hugely grateful to the six test beds for leaning forward and being prepared to have a proper dialogue about whether these things work. Innovations never work the first time. And it's the same with the, the provision of principles. Um, and as it says at the bottom, I'm starting a movement for delivery of these principles across all of you. You're all on my side. Next chart, please. Um, TAPI 2, making it work in the six test beds, is funded by Dunhill, and it's supported wonderfully by the TSA and Housing Lynn. Um, I couldn't do my job without all of them. Next slide, please. However, we're also using um, a co-production capability, co-production works, to help us to gain perspectives, insights, and ideas, uh, and really bring into the process uh, end users. Um, and I, I, thank, um, I thank them enormously for, for playing a part in this work. And finally, we've got Gemma Burgess at Cambridge to act as our evaluation partner, um, just to, to sort of walk us through um, the learnings and make sure, frankly, that we don't just lose it, you know, at the end of the program. Next, please. And here are the six test beds, uh, Scotland, Wales, and England, all doing something somewhat different. And I'm going to encourage you to read up about that in, uh, if you can. And um, uh, we're already getting some very interesting learning. Um, I'll just you know, direct you to some of the lessons that have been learned from Beald in Scotland um, and thank Lynn Douglas and her team for, for being so proactive in working through the TAPI principles or some of them uh, in order to, uh, to give us great guidance. Uh, this work will finish um, towards the end of this year and, and obviously we'll modify the principles. Next chart, please. My big issue is, uh, oh, yes, I should say, uh, I continue to have a steering board. Uh, I, I am not an expert, but this board is hugely expert. Um, they come from academic. Um, they come from business. They come from um, experience, user. Uh, they come from um, design backgrounds hugely valuable to, to, to me, and they're practically advising, and the NHS, by the way, and they're practically advising the six test beds. Next chart, please. Now, you know, I think we may, Sue may want to talk about this in a minute, but we're going to get to the end of TAPI 2, and we'll have got a lot of lessons learned. But the big, the big win will be in significant scale application and implementation. Now, my observation is that that is an issue for many pilots 
working in the health and care area and in the housing area. And it will be no different for the application of TAPI at scale, technology at scale for housing, either retrofitting or in the context of new housing. Now, that implementation needs space. And I, and, uh, I know that Dunhill, myself and others in, on this call will be talking about how we break through the issue of doing great pilots but not getting big scale application. So more on that as we go. Absolutely. Now I'm going to hand back to Sue now and um, maybe we open a conversation up now, Sue. Thanks. Ab thanks absolutely. Very much. No, th <laughs> thanks, Roy. That was an absolute perfect point to end on because, oh, your uh, section on. We're going to have about 10, 12 minutes now. Um, please, if anyone's got questions, um, please put them in the chat box. Um, and while you do that, I just wanted to pick up on that last point of Roy's and put that to David. David, there are lots of examples of some actually great improvements, despite what you know the media talk about that you know everything's going to hell in a handcart. There are actually some exact great examples of improvements being made a lot of the time through the new integrated care systems, not least in Wales and Scotland and in small local pockets. What what's your perspective? What do you think are the barriers to achieving improvement at scale? Thank you, Susan. So um, I think I think there are some good examples in Wales and Scotland. I think there are some good examples in England. So I'm thinking of North Yorkshire, who've been at this for quite some time. Places like Central Bedfordshire, Sunderland, and some London London boroughs. Um, in terms of the barriers, there, there are a lot of people in, there are a lot of organisations in this sector that have to come together to make this work. Um, so we've got housing providers, we've got funders, mm -hmm. sometimes national government, local authorities, um, the housing providers own funding. Um, then they have that all has to stack up. So there has to be uh, the ability to pay for new provision over a period of time. Um, and then I think the other issue is about um, having enough people who know about this, this initiative and what it can deliver. So I think we need to continue to make sure that enough people are capture the vision and enough people know. We've got to make sure that there's the right training and development for the workforce we in thinking about the point that roy made about technology um are we are we actually utilizing technology to enable this to work more effectively answer not enough uh, there are huge opportunities and then going back to the money the filthy lucre then there's something very important about do we have enough evidence uh, that we can display and talk about because the, the, the issue with the pilots is it, we need something more at scale um, in order to, to do that we need consortia of research around this whole thing that keep it going I think we've got good there's good evidence internationally I think we're able to get some good evidence from from the commission um, but we need to keep talking about it and we need to keep um, having a thirst and a hunger for more knowledge across this whole piece yeah, absolutely. Alison, um, you've been keeping an eye on the chat box. Do we have questions coming in from? We do indeed. We had one from Ian Cassidy um, asking for some further elaboration on the key principle of prevention. How do you incentivize prevention, particularly in the housing services world? Yeah. Um... Roy, do you want to have a have a go at that? Well, yeah, I mean, honestly, that's a great question from Ian. And I I would turn I'm going to turn it round. OK, and I'll, Ian, look, I'll, I'll I'm very happy to have a longer conversation on this. But. Um, yeah, we sure surely have to incentivize. But one of our I, I'm, I'm a I'm a consumerist. Right. And if. If there were a consumer pull, people would include preventative services in their offer, whatever that offer might be. And um, 
So if it was me, what I'd be doing, and I appreciate, by the way, prevention is we, if we don't get there, then we're in real trouble. Um, it would, if it was me, what I'd be doing is I'd be focusing on the messaging to the population at large that there are opportunities to live better longer that are out there, but that they don't know about. And that in the end, I suspect increased consumer pull will enhance the provision from housing providers. Uh, I should, that's one thing. I should, so the second thing is, to my mind, this is all to do with existing housing, not new housing, because we all know, don't we, that by 2042, uh, 85, well, in 2042, 85% of the homes that we live in today are already built. So it's not as if we're, we're, we're going to change the world by building new houses or even building new provision necessarily. Um, so happy to con have a conversation on those subjects. Thanks. Okay. Alison, looks like we've got more. Yep. Um, perhaps a question for David from Julian Mayer about um, no mention so far of dementia. Should that be seen as part of the whole or should there be special consideration in respect of particularly housing issues? Do you want me to come in on that? Yes, please, David. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, great question, Julianne. Thank you. Um, and right to prompt it. Um, so if I if I just uh, just quickly go back to the previous question, say something, just one quick thing about that. I think um, health and care services in this country are under enormous pressure. And there is a, a real issue about maintaining prevention whilst dealing with today's current exigencies and crises. Um, but I think that uh, most leaders in health and care are now thinking, if we don't get into, into prevention, we'll never be able to turn the tide and help people to live better lives, but also um, to be more sustainable in the future. So I think, and, and the thing about population health and population health management which are the actual um requirements of um the of the new integrated care partnerships are um are critical to this in terms of setting a template for it and um it's one of the things i got down the country talking to systems about anyway going back to the dementia question absolutely it is part of it um and indeed uh, in the early part of development on housing solutions, when I was a director, I remember people saying, well, actually, this doesn't really apply to people with dementia, does it? And it absolutely does. And there's pretty good research evidence that if you adopt housing solutions at the right point, then people can be sustained living better quality lives in housing with care and support and indeed uh, NHS treatment uh, for longer. Um, and sometimes uh, for the duration. Um, so it, it's absolutely uh, critical. The importance of a good training development of the workforce. It also speaks to um, having a, the appropriate design of housing facilities that can help um, ensure people are safe. It also speaks to good technology. Um, and as the chair of tech quality, um, there were a couple of certificates I awarded at this week's conference to uh, services who run, um, have uh, monitoring systems which help to keep people safe and monitor their and, and adjust their needs in a way that can help sustain and support people. So I think, um, and, it, and it plays to the prevention thing actually, because, um, Prevention works at different levels. It's there's primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. So what we want to do is to help people to have healthier, happier lives for longer. But we also want to ensure that, that people are able to avoid the next next first next adverse event in their lives that will actually diminish their independence and their choice and control. In other words, enhance it. And this is what this is all about, in my view. 
some very interesting uh, discussion in the chat, particularly around the whole prevention. And we're all, <laughs> obviously not going to have time to cover all the questions, but perhaps we could uh, conclude with one from Joanna Davis and address this to Roy in the first instance. Very important question about equity and differential effectiveness. How do you ensure that innovations don't benefit the better off most and yeah. therefore increase the inequalities that we're trying to battle against? Yes. And do you have scope in your pilots to look at this? Yes, it's a, um, it's a, first of all, in the, the, the pilots do not look at, um, to, to use a term, rich, rich people's ability to engage with technology. Um, and and I'm just going to suggest that you take a look at the, the work that the pilots are doing. However, it is a good question. Um, uh, it's a it's a good question, particularly in the context of any building of a consumer platform for the use of technology. Um, however, let's just be clear. Let's take a technology that exists today and is in the hands of consumers. Take the iPhone. Uh, I, I don't think anybody would argue that only the rich, only rich people have iPhones. They don't. And, and I think what is key here is to try to get the value equation that people will see. And I'd love to have more conversations on this. The value equation that people see in the use of technology for their lives at home to be one which which balance which makes them value those things more than some of the other things that they buy um and if you do that then you reach a broad population in my opinion now for the very poorest in our population then clearly we've got to support them directly but i i don't think that's the that's the majority of people i think we can drive a big effect in a lot of people by just creating that better balance in terms of the value of what great lifestyle support and health and care support technologies can bring. There. I hope that helps, Alison. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed. Um, should we move on, Sue? Yeah, I sorry, I there's some really interesting. I'm really sorry not to be able to deal with the, the questions. We um we we know that you didn't want to be kept for a, a long time today, but but wanted to be able to to have the opportunity for at least some questions. We're gonna try and capture these and we will come back to you. And as our fantastic speakers have said, um, not least Roy, if you do want to have um longer debates on this then um, they say that they will make themselves available um, to do that and to, to, to have personal conversations with you. So that's great and thank you for that. Um, so I, I now um, want to start to, to draw this to a close by inviting our chair, Alison, um, to tell you about some exciting new developments that, that we have coming. Um, but for now, thank, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm gonna hand over to Alison. Oli, can we have? Yeah, and, uh, Many thanks to David, Roy, and everyone who joined us on those commissions and on the TAPI journeys. Um, I've been very heartened in my time as chair by these developments. And obviously, we now move into the critical phase of moving from some of the principles into the practice. So, do watch this space. Before we let you go, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you about some of our future plans at Dunhill. Um, and Sue's already hinted at some of these. Sue said earlier that one of the key principles we set out in that strategic framework was that of making connections and convening networks. And while obviously we're not the largest of organizations, we are perhaps the only funder uniquely focused on aging and older people. And we're certainly in it for the long haul. What hopefully we can do is make sure that we are playing our part at the heart of a network of researchers and passionate community leaders who believe that addressing health inequalities 
is one of the most important challenges we face as a society and which underpins the change that needs to be made to secure a healthier later life for us all. So with that in mind, the experience of the last three years has reinforced, reinforced to all of us the importance of creating and fostering networks of support, celebrating success, sort of spaces mm. to learn and explore solutions to the many challenges that we've already touched upon. Conversations with existing professional membership organisations, such as the British Geriatric Society and the recently formed uh, networks by the biotechnology and by the medical research councils have highlighted that there is a real appetite not to duplicate existing networks, not to reinvent wheels, but to provide a forum for connecting people working in a range of professions and disciplines. So the purpose of these would be to celebrate success, achievement and ambition in ageing related research, to create a supportive place, to find new collaborators, one outside one's normal uh, sphere, mentors and advisors, to facilitate better understanding and to foster relationships between academic and clinical researchers and community organizations working with older people, something very close to my own heart, and to sustain existing and emerging networks for the longer term to avoid duplication and reinvention. As a funder with a charitable mission, we are keen to provide ways in which we can help researchers to translate research into practice, to make new connections, to showcase and encourage the key principles we want to uphold in this area, both in relation to the research itself and in the delivering of the health and social care services. So in respect of that, we are therefore delighted to announce the launch of the DMT Academy, which you see on your screen at the moment. What will be the benefits for you? As an Academy member, you will have access to an expanding searchable portal of other researchers and research ready community organizations. You'll have advance notice of future funding schemes and member only schemes. You'll have a platform for advertising job vacancies. You'll have professional development opportunities. You'll have networking and shared learning events. And you'll have opportunities to sit on or to observe grant award panels. So I hope that sounds like an exciting opportunity. And for those who are academic and clinical research members, there'll also be the opportunity to be nominated for our annual excellence awards. Next slide, please. So that brings me to the second announcement. Each year, we are going to make two three-year awards of uh, 40,000 a year, so a total value of 120,000 to two Academy researcher members. One of these will go to an early mid-career researcher who has demonstrated leadership potential. And the second one will go to a senior leader in aging related research who has demonstrated that they uphold the principles that we hold strong. Nominations for these awards will be opened later in 2023, with the first award being made this time next year. And I'm delighted to 
be able to announce that the first round of our awards will be made in the name of Professor Stuart Parker, one of our trustees who sadly died earlier this year and will be greatly missed by the Dunhill community as well as of course the wider world. Next slide please. Then for community organisation members of the Academy, we will be launching our new capability development programme. This will comprise a half million commitment to support three cohorts, each of which will have eight community organisations. And over a period of three years, they will once again work with Moore Kingston Smith, our delivery partner for a similar endeavor in the past, but this time working also for the first time with the University of Birmingham. And the program will be expanded to deliver both online, face-to-face, -face, peer support content around the many issues uh, strategic development, financial sustainability, impact evaluation, and how to work across the research community divide. And we're currently working through the final details of this initiative, so do watch out for further announcements. Final slide, please, Ollie. And for the final announcement, we're now turning to the funder community and we're pleased to announce that Dunhill will be convening with UKRI, UK Research and Innovation, a revitalized UK Aging Research Funders Forum. The membership of the forum is drawn from funding organisations across UKRI and the third sector and one of our first priorities will be to work closely with the two new um, Research Council funded ageing research networks that I mentioned earlier in pulling together a gap analysis of which are the key underfunded, under-researched areas to which hopefully both government and funding organisations will be um, motivated to respond. And the forum should also provide a supportive space for the collaboration needed to address these gaps. Now more than ever, not surprisingly, it feels really important that we address the big questions arising from a population that is aging. And while the issue is increasingly acknowledged by government, with some recent targeted investment in some areas of research, we still haven't seen the substantial ring-fenced support at the scale that we saw in the early 2000s. It is essential that those of us with funds to invest in this important topic work together to ensure we are funding effectively, avoiding overlap, and in complementary, innovative and accessible ways. Again, another of my hobby horses. So I hope that in these new developments, there'll be something for all of you who joined us today. It only remains for me to commend to you the recorded talks we're going to be releasing next month. We'll be circulating the links for those to all of you who registered, and it will of course also be on social media. So I really hope that after the false dawn this year, this time next year, we really will be meeting in person. And that perhaps also we'll be meeting some of you at our early career researchers event in the autumn. Our next task at Dunhill coming up in May will be to make our awards from the Aging Immune System follow-on call. We continue to support the theme of understanding the mechanisms of aging and treating age-related disease. 
central parts of the same dilemma. And our next large planned call for proposals will be on the subject of sensory loss. So do watch out for that and start thinking about your winning ideas. So let me close by wishing you all a pleasant afternoon, urging you to look out for the links to the lectures that Sue flagged up at the beginning. And you can, of course, the usual advert, follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or registering for updates on our website. Thank you very much indeed, and best wishes to everyone.